and that brand new sponsorship, Jurassic Park, the ride on board the number 24. And even when we watched on the racetrack, went, wow, that's that thing is unbelievable. When's when's it going to give up? You know, when's it going to slide up the racetrack? And nah, it wasn't. Jim such an awesome car that NASCAR said, we don't want you to bring this version back. And they made some rule changes so, so that we could. Typically, I don't like to cover vehicles by themselves. Usually, I like to cover the stories of the people who drove them, built them, or were involved one way or another. But today, I'm going to make an exception. But before I properly begin, I want to raise you a particular question. How do you define cheating? In most sports, it's fairly cut and dry. Like, don't alter the baseball field before the rest of the team shows up or doctor the ball in any way. These are fair enough. I mean, this would completely lopside the game one way or another. Whoever decides to do end up doing it in the first place. But what about in motorsports? Is it cheating if the car in question has a little bit conveniently too much boost pressure? Is it cheating if... There's a sudden trap door with lead shot in it, which allows the car to be lightened during racing. After all, especially if there's no rule particularly outlining that there's going to be post-race tech inspection, who would know? Now, as much as these are clever bits of innovation, you could clearly see a case made for cheating here. A team would have to have the methodology and capability, mostly financially, of being able to find ways of developing and engineering these types of templates into cars, but they are sort of self-policing in their own right. In the case of a little bit too much boost pressure, who's to say that car doesn't suddenly go kabang? I mean, yes, it's possible that they may have had the engineering forethought to imagine the thing exploding, also conveniently, halfway in the race, DNFing them. But likewise, in the case of a little bit of lead shot, who's to say that that doesn't make the car a little bit too loose? And instead of helping you find victory lane, helps you find the outside wall in last place. But I want to propose another question to you. What if this supposed cheating was well within the bounds of a team, both financially, engineering-wise, and other methodology besides, to be incorporated into any and all cars in its respective field? Would it be considered cheating if you, say, tooled around with a car's suspension enough to be still within range of motion, but still stiff and strong enough to be just about completely bottoming out the car, but in doing so providing you the aerodynamic benefits you'd want. Any team can do it, it's just that nobody's discovered it yet. Would it be cheating if you were the first? Being the first to the punch, using the same thing everybody else has, just from a different lens. Well, I bring this up to you because the car that we're about to focus on today is a very special bit of Hendrick's secret weapon, a project led up by Ray Evernham and a bunch of geniuses in the 24 team. A car so forward-thinking that it had to be banned. This is a story of a few pissed-off race teams and a phone call. This is the story of Hendrick's T-Rex. T-Rex was not originally called T-Rex at all but actually a much more boring name, chassis code number 2429. The idea for its inception and the ideas and concepts associated to it were created in the back offices of Hendrick Motorsports, and was from the result of the meeting of the minds, not unlike something you'd see at Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works. In this case, using that analogy, Hendrick's head Clarence Kelly Johnson was none other than the man of Rex Stumpf, well, the main ideas in regards to its development are often associated with Ray Evernham specifically. It was actually Rex Stumpf who helped lead these discussions, look over the rule book, and help finalize any ideas and decisions therein. Said ideas would come from crew chiefs from the other Hendrick teams, putting them all together into one concise package. In turn, this ideas package would be contrasted against a 24-team checklist that hung in the office. From nobody to upstart, from upstart to contender, from contender to winner, and from winner to champion, and from champion to dynasty. Countless ideas from over 60 different people were proposed to help make the perfect experimental monster. Initial tests at tracks like Charlotte do not show particular promise. In fact, the car is at least two to three tenths off the pace of the regular car by contrast. 
To get around the Radical New Car's problems, Radical New Solutions had to be found to compensate for the issue. What was that particular solution? Well, to quote Ray Evernham himself, I said, put a pair of 1400s in that thing and give me the biggest sway bar you got, which is like an inch and three eighths, and jam a pair of 450s in the back out of that thing. What we know now is that we dropped the front and got the underbody aerodynamic deal to work. At first glance, this may sound like an insane idea, as it would actually cause an aerodynamic deficit, particularly on the straights. The resulting higher valence would increase drag, reducing the overall potential top speed. But, because of the way the car would land in the corners, this created excellent downforce, making it absolutely zip around the turn. To put it another way, what it Ray and Rex and the others have created was more or less a 3400 pound bow tie badged Lotus 79. And zip around Charlotte it did, as it wasn't just a second faster, but a second tenths faster than the regular cup car that typically run there. Ray would get the well deserved pats on the back, and he knew that a chassis engineering education paid off. Meanwhile, whilst Jeff Gordon was busy getting his job off the floor, being in complete shock as to what the hell he had just driven, Preparations were made to qualify for the Winston at Charlotte. And qualify they would have done, and in dominating fashion, had Jeff Gordon not missed his pit box during the qualifying runs. Awesome Bill from Dawsonville would be that day's pole sitter, and the other big story of the day being Ricky Craven managing to race his way in via the Winston Open. As Buster Otten paces them around Charlotte once more, there's murmurings about what the car is capable of, but nothing is really being explicitly said just yet, and certainly nothing as far as the TV broadcast is concerned. Other concerns are raised, however, about the Richard Shoulders crew. Typically, Larry Mack would help let Dale know about when to take the green flag, but due to the mass amounts of flash bulbs, there's no way in hell he's able to do that, so the onus is on the spotter to let him know when to start. Speaking of the start, Little did anybody know, except for the sole few who built it, the SR-71 that was about to be unleashed on the F4 Phantom field. However, it wouldn't take long for just about everybody to notice. The out-and-out -out speed, especially given where Jeff started, was nothing short of incredible. And, unlike the SR-71, this couldn't be less of a secret if they tried. In fact, Ray was more than happy to talk about this being the quote-unquote new wave and cup car design, and how incredible the experimental chassis was coming to be. But then again, could you blame him? Jeff Gordon is sitting patiently in his car, Jeff. Not too bad of a showing for this debut of this new 24 car, 19th to 3rd. Yeah, that's what this race is all about, man. You just go all out. I tell you, when the car is as fast as this thing is, there's no way I'm going to hold back. I'm going to go all the way. and. Uh, uh, I need a few more laps. I think I could have got those guys. We got a little bit tight. We're going to free it up. We're going to be even better this second segment here. Right, let's go back upstairs to Eli. Despite him complaining about the tight situation, he definitely went all out, finishing fourth in this segment. But the show wasn't over just yet. The final 10 lap shootout would decide it all. Would T Rex and Jeff get a six figure payday? Jeff knew that all he had to do was pass the Brothers Labonte. Jeff Gordon would show the scale electric car, I mean the Chevy Monte Carlo, could take just about any kind of line he wanted to, opting to take the high side to get around Bobby. His next and final major obstacle was that of the other Labonte, Texas Terry. Now all he had to do was stick with him and find a slot past. Sure enough he would, but only for a brief moment. Terry would get the initial jump off turn 3, but Terry didn't have what Jeff did and that was corner speed. And sure enough, he had no choice but to watch Jeff sail away, coming off of turn four. Ray here might not believe it was much of a gamble, and that might be true for the race, but it definitely was even in pre-race tech inspection. Yes, it was above board, and yes, they crossed their T's and dot their I's when it came to checking the rule book, but you just never know. And if there was any person in particular who was nervous about the ordeal, it was none other than Rex Stump himself, who was concerned about the fact that it was being so openly discussed. Perhaps if nobody said a damn thing at all, and just treated it as any other car, they might not have ended up being under the microscope so quickly. As briefly mentioned earlier, other team owners were not happy. Oh, that's an understatement. They were incredibly pissed off about the run that T-Rex had done. 
going as far as to argue that, with the current cup car templates, they'd never be able to come anywhere near what Hendrick had pulled off in the creation of T-Rex. But that was the least of Ray's worries. There was a group of people that had an even bigger interest in what that car was all about. None other than NASCAR themselves were keen as to what was going on and how it was able to do what it did. Whilst Jeff Gordon was getting cut a six-figure paycheck, Ray got a tap on his shoulder about a certain visitation from a very certain Bill France Jr. Initially, Ray assumed that it was going to be congratulations and a stogie, but this turned out to be anything but. Ray went up to the NASCAR hauler, patiently waited as Big Bill finished his sig, and simply said, You need to pick up that phone right there and tell your boss that that car ain't legal. Ray was stupefied. What? But the car made tech inspection. The car is 100% legal. We did everything by the rules. Mr. France once again looked over at him, took another drag off his cigarette, and simply said, Well, it won't be tomorrow. Looks like old Rex was right to be worried about what the consequences would be about highlighting the upshots to the design. Speaking of Rex, he ended up pleading with NASCAR, asking as to why the hell the car was illegal in the first place. And that could have been one of the worst ideas imaginable as, well, it basically gave NASCAR the green light to blow the book open on all the secrets that they had uncovered, and in turn allow them to be added to the rulebook bit by bit. NASCAR basically said, Yeah, we see your Nighthawk. Beautiful bit of kit. We knew it was stealthy, and now we know exactly why it's stealthy, and how to counter it, so we never have to deal with it ever again. After the rulebook kibosh that was levied against T-Rex, and unfortunately never ran the same in the new rules package, it would make one more final appearance, this time in DuPont colors at the 1997 Brickyard, but that was that. It was never quite the same car, the overpowered weapon becoming nerfed and redundant, going the way of the Akimbo Model 1887s. Also, it's worth mentioning that despite the bemoaning from the garage area about how they couldn't do what Ray did, they were very conveniently obscuring the truth that teams had actually come very close, if not were actually capable of, the same thing that Ray was doing in a similar fashion. Coil binding was already starting to show itself in the sport in the late 1990s, but it wouldn't show up en masse until the 2000s. It just took them a little bit of time, but from the halls of the likes of DEI, it was only a matter of time before somebody was able to catch up with what the 24 team had done. Still, even with other teams catching up, this was the first car to do coil binding, to the point where it wasn't even called coil binding yet. And also, despite how innovative it is, the act of coil binding too is now old hat, as in, it went away along with the car of tomorrow. So, now we don't even see anything as far as that kind of trickery anymore, but that shouldn't stop us from admiring this amazing bit of kit. Alongside its fantastically iconic livery, it will forever be one of the most interesting bits of engineering that any NASCAR team has ever devised. For the second time in his career, Jeff Gordon is in victory lane for the Winston. Glenn Jarrett's with him. <laughs> bunch of confetti. Jeff is really excited. He, he really wanted to get out of the car. He is, is it, as excited as I have ever seen him. Makes a big drink of Pepsi there. Jeff, come on down here, man. First of all, congratulations. Great run. And I want to know, what was the question you asked uh, Wayne Robertson there with Winston? How much money? Show me the money. <laughs> How much money did I win, man? This is awesome. I tell you what, we're going to name this the T-Rex Mobile right here uh, because uh, Rex Dumb and all the guys in the R&D department built this chassis. We're going to name it after him. And uh, i got to thank God. Uh, it's certainly on my side. That's a hectic race out there. And uh, to do what we did, come from the back to the front twice, and then to win that thing was awesome. And I uh, want to thank DuPont Automotive Fishes, Quaker State, Pepsi, Goodyear had a great tire, and Chevrolet, of course. Uh, good to know without that Monte Carlo. Jeff, you had to know you had a great race car after that first segment when you came all the way from the back road to finish up near the front like you did. You pretty much knew you had something for them. I knew I had an awesome race car. I'm telling you, that thing was bad to the bone. Uh, I drove in the first turn that stuck like glue, and I said, oh, yeah, here we come, man. And uh, I tried 
you know, I, really my plan wasn't to try to win that first segment. Uh, I was going to just try to get as far as I could, but I didn't know I was going to get all the way up to third and maybe have a shot at winning it. But I uh, want to thank R.J. Reynolds and Winston. They give us a lot of money for this championship, but they give us a lot of money to come out here and have fun and put on a great show for these fans. And they sure did that. Congratulations to Jeff and the whole team. Back to you, Eli. All right, Glenn. He's only the third multiple winner of the Winston. Dale Earnhardt with three wins. The late Davey Allison with two. And now Jeff Gordon with two wins in the Winston. To the garage, Bob. Time to go back into the midst of all of that celebration for the Miller Lite Pit Crew Award. Brought to you by Miller Lite. We'll invite you to sit back and enjoy Miller time. Glenn Jarrett. And the recipient, of course, is Ray Everham. Ray, you guys did an awesome job preparing that car. Jeff said he knew on the first lap when he drove it in, it stuck like that. Man, I got something for him. But uh, you guys did a lot of hard work, a lot of preparation. Well, a lot of people did. You know, this victory, uh, you talk about a uh, team victory. This is our Hendrick Motorsports research and development car, and everybody back at Hendrick Motorsports, all 150 people work real hard on this car, you know, so it's uh, it's something new, and I know this is making uh, Rick awful happy, but a lot of people worked on this race car, just wasn't the Rainbow Warriors, so congratulations to all of them. Hey, am I hearing this right? This is a test car? Yeah, this was just a test. Pretty doggone good test, and it sure is not a dinosaur. Congratulations, Ray. Thank you very much. This was only a test. Had it been a real emergency, <laughs> we would have left the field.